I'm very excited to welcome you all to our 2022 series for the Saturday Physics for Everyone. We are so glad to see you all back in person. Um, this is our first in-person series since 2019, so we're very excited. Um, a quick introduction. My name is Irene Lira Anseger, and I'm the coordinator of undergraduate um, recruitment, research, and placement. So that means I help our undergraduate students with their needs other than the academic side of things. Um, which means, in this case, I am the coordinator of the, under, of the Saturday Physics for Everyone program. Um, for, for, those of us, for those of you joining us for the first time today, the Saturday Physics for Everyone is a fall program. Uh, it's a lecture series for all ages, and we get to share with the, with the community our exciting research in the physics department, um, and then also help you to see what kind of discoveries and innovations you might be working on if you had a physics degree. Uh, this fall, we have a great lecture series lecture series lined up, um, and to start us off, we have Professor Sung Jin Kim. <coughs> Professor Kim studied chemistry as an undergraduate student in the Seoul, Seoul National University in South Korea, and received her PhD from Harvard University in 2010 under the supervision of X Suni Z. Her thesis research on single molecule biophysics uncovered DNA ancestry, by which DNA-bound proteins can affect each other's DNA binding properties at a distance. This was published in Science in 2013. To study how single molecules function inside of cells, Professor Kim switched her research area to microbiology and conducted her postdoctoral research in Christine Jacob Wagner's lab at Yale University. She studied spatio-temporal regulation of transcription translation and mRNA degradation in bacterial cells using both experimental and computational approaches. She joined the Department of Physics at Illinois in January of 2019 um, and is excited to combine her expertise in single molecule biophysics, microbiology, and computational modeling to study the complexity of living cells at the single molecule and single cell levels. So please join me in welcoming Professor Seng Jin Kim. For the nice introduction. All right, nice to meet you, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming on Saturday morning. So when I was uh, before I came to U of I, I was just wondering how this department was like. So I googled University of Illinois Physics, and the first thing that popped up as a video was Saturday seminar, this uh, lecture series. And I thought it was a great series that we can communicate with uh, community members and basically tell, tell you about what's going on in our lab laboratories. And I'm really super excited about uh, telling you about what's going on in our laboratory and um, tell you about this topic, which is about traffic on the genome. OK, so thinking about all kinds of uh, living things on Earth, like humans, animals, insects, and plants, there are lots of things in common of all, the, all these uh, living organisms. Um, they all eat, they need energy, they grow in size, and they reproduce, they reproduce offsprings, and they go over generations and generations, and they die sometimes, right? <laughs> Most of them, all of them die, right, eventually? and so on and so forth. So these common characteristics are coming from the fact that they all come, they all have same organization, which is made of cells. So the basic unit of all kinds of living organisms is a cell. So human is made of cells, insects are made of cells, plants are made of cells. And these cells are important because they contain the hereditary material called DNA. So DNA defines us, and DNA defines us, I mean, DNA defines, I mean, uh, differentiate us uh, from monkeys. Uh, individual, uh, individuals have different DNA sequences. So DNA is really important material uh, that um, defines living creatures. 
So what is DNA for, for a cell? So this is just a, di like, uh, a cartoon uh, of cell, which is like a, looks like a ball, right? So cell is basically a membrane, uh, like a bag, that carries all the materials that is important for the life processes. And in the center of this bag is a DNA, this purple. So cell, DNA is important for cell, just like recipe book is important for a bakery. So the relationship between cell and DNA is like a recipe book to a bakery. Why is that? So if I want to start a bakery business, I probably need a very good bakery book. I mean, a recipe book, right? That contains all kinds of bread that I want to make and sell in my, in my bakery. Similarly, if, I want, if a cell is going to be built, it needs a recipe book. It's called DNA. And out of this recipe, a bread will be made, and that bread is called proteins. So you probably heard of proteins. Some of you like drink protein drinks. Um, there is also a protein, for example, like some of us do not have ability to digest lactose, so you have to drink lactose-free milk, and that is because the body doesn't have a protein that can digest lactose. So proteins are really important to build body as well as the body to function properly. So when lots of proteins, all kinds of function of proteins, proteins that carry all kinds of function can be made out of the recipe book, they will fill the space, the proteins will fill the space, and then they basically build a cell. So cell is basically made out of a variety of proteins. This is just a simulation result showing that there can be uh, proteins of different shapes. The green is more elongated and then more globular shapes. And proteins of all different shapes and sizes basically come together um, and uh, build a cell. Okay, so how is a DNA organized? It's a recipe book, so it must have some recipes that are organized some in some fashion. So DNA is like actually a string, as you see here. And then in the, on this string, there are recipes that are in series. So these individual recipes are called genes. And the collection of these genes are basically DNA, or it's called genome. The is gene and ohm is because ohm is uh, meaning a collection of something. So genome means that it's a collection of recipes or a collection of genes. So let's say there is a first gene, uh, first recipe, let's say that's a, a recipe for a donut, for example. And there is a second gene that follows that is a recipe for a bagel that you're eating right there. And there is a third gene that like, comes next, there's a recipe for another bread, and so on and so forth. Okay, so how do we make bread or proteins out of this recipe book? So one way we do it in a bakery is that there is a recipe book, but you want to probably keep it somewhere safe. And each time you make bread, you want to copy the recipes so that you can keep this recipe book on the side, and then maybe it's very uh, precious. You don't want to basically ruin it with, with all kinds of uh, mess going on in the kitchen, kitchen right? So recipe book is kept, and then re copy, re uh, recipes are copied each time you make the proteins. So that can be one way uh, the bread is made out of the recipe book. Same thing is going on inside the cell. So DNA, the recipe book, is basically there. And then each time a protein should be made, the gene, the, the recipe, is being copied. And this copy of a gene, or copy of the DNA, is called RNA. So RNA is basically a copy of the, of the recipe code that was uh, written on the DNA. And then molecularly, it's basically just single-stranded um, string instead of a double-stranded um, rope-like structure that DNA has. And RNA basically means a transcript or a copy of the gene. 
Okay, so next question is how is the DNA, the recipe copied out of this recipe book? So let's look at this first gene, the red part. So um, the gene is basically having its basic recipe start from start site, and then it ends at where it ends. And there is a copying machine that actually recognizes the start of the recipe, and then basically copy from start to the end, just like what we imagine for copying a recipe. This copy machine that was starting and then ending was co is called RNA polymerase. It's polymerizing RNA. It's basically uh, copying and making the transcript. So that's what it calls RNA polymerase. So this is an animation to show you what's happening in actual three dimension. Um, so this is a red is a rope that looks like that looks like a rope, but it's a DNA. And then green. Um, Blob here is RNA polymerase. This is uh, the copying machine that is running on the DNA to copy the se sequence written on the DNA into a transcript. So red is the DNA, yellow is a copy that is being generated by this uh, copy machine. Okay, so you could see that this green uh, copy machine is very efficient. It basically starts and it doesn't fall off. It, it's very fast and it can basically read through until it reaches to the end. So I'd say these copy machines are like cars running on the highway. And you'll see why. So here is a string of DNA. And then there are different genes, different recipes. And then they basically, they like, just like highway, there's entrance for first recipe, first gene, there's exit. And then there's another entrance for this copy machine and another exit. And another entrance, another exit. They can basically change the direction compared to the other ones. And then uh, there's another entrance and another exit. So each recipe basically has an entrance for this copy machine and exit for the copy machine. And if we look at the copy machines, they actually start and then goes until they encounter the exit. In some of the recipes, some of the highway segments, there may be many uh, copy machines running together. Like there are just one versus four over here. There may be some recipe that is not being copied at all, depending on what condition that is. So the traffic phenomenon, there's definitely some kind of traffic phenomenon for these copying machines. The density of these copying machines can be different depending on where you look at. Uh, and then also, we are wondering how they move in when depending on the traffic phenomenon. OK, so let's think about uh, from our daily lives. Uh, we sometimes encounter traffic in the highway. So uh, this is a Google map showing different uh, segments of highway have uh, different traffic. So the red means there is a high volume of traffic because of car accident. And then blue means there is a high speed going on or fluidic uh, uh, traffic is going on. So we are, when we are on the road, uh, we think about how the density of traffic is different in different locations. Whether there is actually car accident going on before I hit my destination. And then we think about how fast we can reach to the destination. So there are, there are several concerns that we want to think about when we think about traffic uh, in the real life. And we want to basically impose same questions for this traffic for the copy machines happening on the genome. So let's compare these two things, traffic on the highway that we know from our lives and traffic on the DNA. So DNA is, uh, first of all, very small scale of traffic. It's very small scale traffic. So think about this is a gene, this is a recipe, and these copy machines are running on this recipe. The individual copy machines are, um, they basically cover about 35 bases. Base is a unit of DNA. And one, three base 
of DNA is one nanometers. So this individual copy machines cover only 10 nanometers. They, their size is only 10 nanometers. And then these individual copy machines travel usually about 30 times over their size. So maybe it's a, for a car, it's a, like traveling a block of street. So I mentioned that this copy machine is about 10 nanometers in size. Uh, for your perspective, our hair is about 500,000 nanometers in thickness. So this individual copy machine is 50,000 times smaller. So if you can divide your hair into 50,000 times in thickness, I don't know whether that's possible, but that's basically the size of the, this small, nano, this small uh, copy machine. Okay, so in real life, the traffic of cars uh, have different densities depending on where you look at in the United States. Uh, so this is a density map, and the thicker, thicker red basically means there's high volume of traffic or high density of cars on the highway. And then you can see that it basically is high density near big cities. And that makes sense because there are lots of need and activity going on in, high, in big cities, so there are lots of traffic going in and out of, this, out of those cities. So for traffic, car traffic, density represents the activity and need. And same thing is true for these copy machines. So in this, represent, this cartoon, there is only one car on the first recipe or first gene. And that is likely because this, uh, this, this recipe doesn't really need to be copied a lot. So cell doesn't need to produce this bread a lot. On the contrary, this gene, the number three, has lots of copy machines going on. That means that this, this recipe should be copied a lot because the bread that is made out of this recipe is really important for the cell to live. So the density of these copy machines represent the cellular need to make the individual proteins or bread. And also, interestingly, the need for making certain bread can change over time. So in the morning, you might need to make lots of donuts because people come to get donuts in the morning. But at night, you don't have to make donuts. So the need changes. And accordingly, the density of these copy machines will change. So in our, in our research, what we first asked was, so density of these copy machines can change over time. And how does the density actually affect the speed of these copy machines running on the DNA? And why did we ask this question? So if, before we, I go on, the density basically means the number of cars or number of the uh, copy machines in a unit length. So speed and density relationship is quite interesting because it tells us about how these cars interact each other. What do I mean by that? So when we think about highway traffic and looking at the speed and density relationship for the cars, as the density increases, the speed drops that we know from our experience. And that is because as density increases, we tend to put, uh, press our brake. We tend to slow down because there is more chance to meet another car, right? So as the density, the car volume increases, the speed of individual cars drops. The underlying interaction is what we call exclusion process. We basically try to avoid collisions between other cars. So when we have more tendency to collide with other cars, which happens at high density uh, situation, we tend to slow down. So this speed and density relationship can tell us that there is exclusion process going on between these cars. What about if the cars are like bumper cars? So in a situation when you are just by yourself in a bumper car park, you probably, it's not fun, you just drive here and there. But if there is uh, another friend with you in the bumper car park, you probably want to accelerate and then try to collide, right? So as uh, density increases a little bit, your speed increases. And if sometimes you collide with your friend car, and then that generates instantaneous push that can also increase the speed. 
right? So density and speed relationship can be the opposite. Of course, if density goes too high, then it's too jammed in the, in the bumper car park, so you can't move around. But in the beginning of low density regime, there can be this kind of relationship. That's the opposite of what's happening in car traffic. So this speed and density relationship can tell us there's uh, very different things going on between the cars. So bumper cars like to hit and they push each other, they accelerate when they see another car instead of decelerating. So we wanted to see what's happening between these small cars uh, running on the genome. Are they, doing, are they showing this kind of relationship because they like to exclude each other? Or they show this kind of relationship because they like to accelerate and push each other? So by experiment, we wanted to measure the speed and density relationship and to understand how these copying machines interact with each other on the DNA. So that was our reason why we wanted to look at the speed and density relationship. Okay, so to do so, we had to measure the density and speed of these copying machines on the DNA. So this is the cells that we use to study this phenomenon. These are E. coli cells. They are basically bacteria, bacterial cells. They are single cell organism. They carry DNA. So the red stain basically tells us that there is a DNA material in the middle of a cell. They actually occupy most of the cell volume. And then we wanted to measure density of these copying machines on the genome and their speed. Um, it was not easy task because at a given time, there are hundreds of these copying machines running on this long piece of DNA inside the cell. And recognizing which RNA, which uh, copying machine, which RNA polymerase belong to which gene, which part of the recipe is not easy thing to do. And then speed is distance over time. So we had to measure distance and time. Distance we can find, like we can, we know the length of individual recipes, so we can, we know the distance, but we have to measure the time, the time to travel from the beginning of the recipe to the end to calculate the speed. So how did we do this? How, did, how do we do this measurement? So we found a system that we can use. So there is a <laughs> section of a gene in the genome where there is no copying activity at all in a certain condition. So it's like, let's say, it's, like Christmas, it's a recipe for a Christmas cake, and it's summer, so a baker doesn't need to make the, the Christmas cake, right? So in this part of the recipe, there is no copying activity going on at all. But we can trick the cell at time zero, at a given time point. We, we trick the cell and say, oh, this is uh, December, you, st you should start to make the Christmas cake, right? Then cell cells are tricked, so they, they, the RNA polymerase, the copying machine, basically uh, recognize the start of the recipe and then um, transcribe or copy this recipe to make the Christmas cake. Okay, as I said before, uh, this RNA polymerase or copy machine is same as other copy machines that are happening in other parts of the genome, like the, in the parts of the genome where there's making a donuts or bagels. So it's not easy to differentiate this uh, copy machine from others, but what we can easily differentiate is this uh, recipe. There is only one copy, I mean, Christmas cake uh, recipe inside the cell that's coming off of this uh, segment of DNA. So if we're looking for the end of this recipe, this is very unique. It can be only found from uh, this RNA polymerase that is, uh, was running on this part of the genome. So we look for uh, the end of this uh, Christmas cake recipe and then see when, what time this end code is copied. So this tells us the travel time for this copying machine, and we can calculate the speed by dividing the distance that we know by the time, and we get the speed. We can also easily trick the cell with different signal. Say that we, this is near Christmas, and that you need to make a lot more Christmas cake. Then a lot more uh, copying machines are bound to the, this part of the genome, in this recipe, and the density basically increases. 
And then we can do the same measurement to look at uh, whether the speed is actually affected by this high density of uh, copy machines on this DNA. Okay, so when we did the experiment, we found that the x-axis is number of uh, copy machines on this recipe or on the gene. Uh, we varied from zero to eight uh, copy machines, and then their speed was maintained at their optimal speed about 30 base pair per second uh, in most of the density uh, cases. But if the density goes down below a certain threshold, then the speed also drops. So this was something did, we didn't expect uh, from this previous analogy to highway traffic and the bumper car. We were expecting something like this, but this is kind of new type of speed and density relationship that we didn't uh, know how to explain. So we are wondering how we can explain this speed and density relationship. So to make a long story short, we found that these uh, RNA polymerases, RNA piece, the copy machines, are running on the road, but this road, which is a DNA, is not a simple road or like a concrete road that we imagine, right? And that is because DNA is very flexible polymer, actually. So DNA is double helix. It basically means there are two strands they're intertwined together, just like in this, um, 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 how do they call it? This uh, two uh, plastic uh, strands uh, intertwined together. And then because of the fact that they're intertwined together, they're, uh, the way they are twisted each other can be varied. So you can open this um, at the one end of the rope, at uh, one end of this, uh, uh, rope, and then you can twist it more and then rejoin it to make it more twisted. You can open it and then untwist it and then rejoin it to make it under twisted. So it's like a rope that you can imagine from, from the rope that when there are two things intertwined together, you can actually change it more twisted or less twisted. So this is a DNA and copying machines are basically running from this end to that end. There can be multiple ways that it can run over this. It can basically run around this helical pitch to run from start to end. It can basically stay on one side of the rope and just stay, uh, basically just go uh, one dimensional like uh, scan from here to there. But it actually, this copying machine actually opens this rope as it goes. So just like this two hand motion is doing, the copy machines wanna read what's in between the two strands and open it. And as it goes from start to the end, it basically keeps opening the two ropes, uh, two strands. So as a consequence, uh, the front of this copy machines get over twisted and in the back of this copy machine is already untwisted by the past activity, right? So the DNA's the twisting uh, status changes when uh, this copy machine runs on it. So in molecular biology, people basically model this like this, as these copy machines run on the two-stranded, I mean, the DNA helix that is made of two-strand. Over-twisting happens in front of this car, and untwisting happens in the back. So over-twisting is termed as positive supercooling for DNA, and untwisting is termed as a negative supercooling happening in the DNA. And biophysics studies have found that these supercoils are bad for RNA polymerases. So when DNA is not twisted at all, RNA, this car can move along the two strands. But if it becomes over-twisted in the front or under-twisted in the back, RNA polymerase, this uh, copying machine cannot proceed to the front because of the DNA being uh, twisted. So it's quite interesting that this copying machine, RNA polymerase, is, uh, it likes to copy the, copy the recipe, but as it copies, it's basically deforming its own road and making trouble. So this is a, just an analogy for uh, this thing, this uh, what's happening for RNA polymerase. Basically, the, 
the road is being uh, changing to uh, in prevent its motion. So something should come and rescue this, uh, this uh, problem, right? There are other cellular factors that actually comes to rescue and remove these supercoils, but we don't know how fast they actually come to rescue this or remove these supercoils. But we found that actually other RNA polymerases, other copying machines can rescue this problem immediately. So let's say there is one single RNA polymerase or the copy machine running by itself on the road, then it produces twisting in the front or untwisting in the back and that's uh, making this copy machines to slow down. So arrow is smaller, that means it's running slower. But when there are other uh, uh, copying machines running on the same, same DNA in same direction, the supercoils are opposite in direction so they can cancel each other. What this means is that this uh, copying machine is trying to over twist the DNA in front of it but the DNA in front of it is already under twisted by the car uh, in front of it. So basically these two supercoils makes it, the DNA back to normal, normal state, which these RNA polymerases like. So by having cancellation of these supercoils between the neighboring copy <coughs> machines, these individual RNA polymerases or the cars can move at a faster or optimal speed. So we can also think about situation where there are less number of RNA polymerases or less, uh, fewer um, copying machines on the gene and their distance is farther to each other. But uh, DNA supercoils can travel quite a distance. So even though two copying machines are separated in distance, uh, the supercoils that they each of them make can travel and also cancel each other. And so actual density of RNA polymerases or actual distance between these copying machines uh, would not be really important for uh, speed. As long as there is more than one copy machines happening or running on the DNA, they can cancel the supercoils and rescue each other and then maintain their optimal speed. So that basically means what we saw in our experiment as the density is um, higher than certain threshold, they can maintain uh, their optimal speed because they can cancel the supercoils between them. But if the density goes too low or the distance become too far from each other, then the supercoils cannot be uh, canceled, they cannot rescue each other, so their speed drops. So that's our current uh, explanation for this speed and density relationship happening for these copy machines. Okay, so the story is not ending here. So if I have this result, then this means that if I tell uh, my students that, okay, there are four RNA polymerases or four copy machines running on this row, on this DNA, and now I wanna trick the cell again and say that I don't need to copy this recipe anymore. So I wanna basically block this star site. And how these four RNA polymerases move? If the number is the only determinant for the speed, they will basically move at 30 base pair per second, which is their optimal speed, because they are, they are four. They basically, they are over the threshold. However, in the experiment, what we found by tricking the cell again, we found that these RNA polymerase slow down incredibly. So in addition to the actual number, in actual density, there is another factor that is affecting the speed. So speed and density relationship, in the speed and density relationship, there is another factor that is affecting the speed. So this is our explanation for what's happening. So when there are multiple copying machines going running together, they are canceling the supercoils between them so they can move at their optimal speed, so they can rescue each other. But let's say we consider a situation where we stop the entrance, so there is no more traffic coming in. Then what happens is the last car on this road start to accumulate its supercoil because there's no new car that is canceling this uh, supercoil. So uh, DNA becomes under twisted and that basically accumulated over time and that will slow down this car 
If this car slows down, it's not gonna produce over twisting in the front, so it cannot rescue the other car either. So the other car will also start to accumulate super coals and slow down and so on. So that was interesting phenomenon that we didn't ex expect at all. We couldn't, we basically needed, uh, we wanted to basically understand this phenomenon better. So what physicists do is try to describe the phenomenon by mathematical language and try to see whether we can describe with uh, the physical concepts. So that's what we did. So in, when we wanna build a theoretical model, we basically draw a picture and then change all kinds of conceptual things into a parameters or variables. So when we draw RNA polymerases or copy machines on DNA, we basically number them by their order of loading, so first, second, and third, and that's I. And then we also wanna vary, put, parameterize their position, so we also put a variable for, to indicate their position. And then we can also put parameters for how many super coils they are being made, and that is basically related to how long they traveled from the start site, because the longer they travel, they make more and more super coils. So out of these uh, parameterization of the conceptual things, uh, we can basically build a model that is describing how many supercoils there are in between the cars. And these supercoils are a result of the fact that RNA polymerase exert torque on the DNA. So torque is a force for rotational motion. So just like this pirate is steering the steering wheel, RNA polymerase is basically rotating this rope and ex by exerting torque. So we also want to parameterize that by describing how much torque is stored on the DNA uh, behind and front of these RNA polymerase. And then we say how much this torque affects the speed. So there's another equation for describing how is the speed of these RNA polymerase is affected by the torque. So doing all these equations, we can we produce this kind of graph where we can have we can theoretically say how the speed of this uh, RNA polymerase or the car varies depending on the density. So x-axis is basically approximation for density. So the theoretical model basically said the density as a as a in a wide region where density varies, the speed is maintained something close to 30 base pair per second. But if the density goes down too low, then the, the speed drops. And then if the star side is closed, then we see that even for the same density, uh, there's a huge drop in the speed of RNA polymerases. So density is not the only determinant for the speed, uh, but actually we should also consider how the star side is, uh, what the state of the star, star side is. So the nice thing about having this mathematical model or the equations that describe this uh, graph is that now we can basically say I have this much density and, and I don't have to do experiment. I can basically uh, solve the equation and say the speed of these copy machines will be very low uh, when the star size is blocked. So the mathematical model basically gives us ability to predict what's happening in certain situation that we can uh, do the experiments. So I started from my story from talking about speed and density that we could measure from experiments. And to explain that, I brought up the concept of DNA supercoils. And our mathematical model could basically uh, uh, support their, our idea that supercoils can affect the speed of these copy machines but we actually didn't actually experimentally measure the supercooling, right? So our next question is whether we can actually visualize supercooling and whether we can actually see the cancellation of DNA supercoils between these copy machines. So how do we actually visualize these uh, twisting of DNA? So in our model, when the two copy machines are uh, moving in the same direction, they each produce um, over twisting, so this RNA polymerase produce over twisting in front, this RNA polymerase produce under twisting in the back. And we actually wanna see how fast these supercoil property travel along the distance 
um, inside the cell. And that is because inside the cell, there are other proteins that are bound to this DNA. And then we also want to know how these uh, other roadblocks on the DNA affects this uh, dynamics of supercoils. So this is our next question that we are up to. So I can introduce you what other biophysicists have uh, approached to this um, problem. So a group in Netherlands, uh, they made this cool instrument where they could create DNA supercoils and visualize them. So here you see is a DNA uh, that is outside the cell. They purify the DNA piece of string, piece of DNA piece. And then one end they tether to the cover slip or glass slide. And the other end is tethered to a magnetic bead. And then their instrument has this rotating magnet that is imposed on top of this sample. And then when these magnet rotates, uh, this bead basically follows it, and this, this bead rotates together with the magnetic motion, magnet's motion. And the rotation of bead produces supercooling on the DNA because this is basically rotating uh, the rope. So once they rotate it or produce DNA supercoils, they move the magnet to the side of the sample. So then now the bead is on the, on, on, on the side or over the cover slip. And then they can basically image this, this supercooled structure of DNA. What they did was they uh, uh, added DNA staining dye. So this dye basically stains everywhere along the DNA. And then if there is this kind of DNA structure, then dye is more concentrated over there, or because DNA is more concentrated over there. So they see like blob of dye at the position where there is this super, super cold structure. So what they saw from taking movie of these uh, dye image is that there's a DNA and then they see this blob actually move around. They pops up at different locations. Sometimes they merge. Sometimes they split. So this is really cool that this uh, super cool doesn't stay there. It's actually moving around. They can also disappear and then appear somewhere else. And then two of them can also combine to produce a bigger structure. So this is really cool method to actually show that this structure is very dynamic. Another way to look at DNA supercoil or produce DNA supercoil and see their effect on the DNA is this kind of um, setup where, again, there is a piece of DNA that is purified from a cell. And one end of DNA is captured by a bead. The other end is captured by another bead. And there is a cool technique called optical trap. It's basically made a trap made of very strong laser power, a very strong uh, laser that is focused at this side so they can basically trap a bead over there. So this side of the DNA is basically trapped and hold tight. And the other end of the DNA is grabbed by this bead and that is attached to a pipette. This is uh, like a glass pipette that is um, where the vacuum can be applied. So when vacuum is applied, so just like the end of, um, let's say, vacuum hose, uh, like vacuum cleaner hose, uh, this small bead basically is stuck at the end of this vacuum hose. And then you can rotate this vacuum, vacuum um, tip to, twi to rotate this bead, and as a result, the DNA is being twisted. So this is another clever idea that you can basically manipulate the twisting of DNA uh, by physical means. And then you can, uh, we can uh, put small bead on one, uh, one, uh, one place of DNA and see there actually it's a rotation. So this is a movie from uh, the paper who made this device. So you see two beads. One bead is under the optical trap, so this bead corresponds to this bead. And this bead is under this vacuum uh, micropipette or vacuum hose. Um, and then what they did was they rotated this um, pipette to produce twisting on the DNA. You can see the DNA because DNA is not labeled here, but you see the small bead that is attached to the DNA. After twisting, they relaxed this bead. They basically let this bead go. And then as DNA become un untwisted or back to the normal state, 
they see this uh, small bit rotate crazy because it wants to uh, uh, re re reverse the twisting action happen on the DNA. So you can analyze this image, how fast this bead actually rotate, and then that information can be used in the formula to, produce, uh, to understand how much torque was actually stored on the DNA, uh, depending on how much twisting that was introduced to the DNA in this setup. So this technique actually allows us to measure the torque uh, relation to the twisting action. Okay, so there are many, uh, there are some other techniques that can uh, twist and visualize supercool, so uh, that's nice. The next question is whether we can also visualize the actual copy machines inside the cell. So I mentioned you before that there are so many copy machines uh, running on the genome, so we cannot recognize which copy machine correspond to which recipes and so on. Uh, but there are techniques that can actually capture um, the traffic phenomenon happening in the cell. So this image was actually taken in 1970s, uh, and it's, uh, it stays as a textbook uh, picture because it basically is an image of um, part of the E. coli DNA from E. coli bacterial cells. And this horizontal line basically is a DNA. And you see like the branches are coming off of the DNA. And these branches are basically copied recipes. They are being generated from this recipe. So this is basically the star site or the promoter. And then as you go, like this is small piece of recipe and then the recipe basically grows as, as it goes to the end. So even though we have very nice picture of traffic phenomenon, like there are more dense uh, traffic happening in this part of the recipe and so on, cells are dead and there's no dynamic information. There's no motion happening in this picture. Ultimately, we want to have a traffic camera inside the cell. So that just like traffic camera tell us about how fast cars are moving in different traffic, in different part of the highway, and depending on the time as well. We want to have this kind of very nice video of uh, copy machines running on the genome. But to do so, our camera, tra traffic camera, should have really high sensitivity to capture individual cars. It should also have pretty high spatial resolution. If this image is fuzzy, we can't tell what, how this bus is running, right? Because we cannot resolve this car with this bus. We also need pretty high temporal resolution. If we were taking this image every five minutes or so, this bus has already gone, so we cannot really track this bus over time. So the traffic camera should have uh, take image very at short intervals. And is that possible? So I would say the technique is not there yet. And one of the reason why is this. So in order to grab what's happening inside the cell, we should use a, a technical light microscopy. So that's why, that's because this is most um, live cell friendly technique. So cells can stay alive. And it, this technique allows us to visualize things happening inside the cell without perturbing them or with, without killing the cell. However, the light microscopy has certain limit in resolution. Uh, if there is a, a molecule that is emitting light, uh, because the light is wave and wave can dif be diffracted by uh, things, uh, the light coming out of this point object is actually spread when you actually capture it on the cam in the camera. And the spread is about 200 nanometers, which is quite large compared to the size of the car. So car the RNA polymerase, I said, was 10 nanometers. It's very small compared to how much it's spread, how much the light is spread. So this, is, this, this resolution is a problem, especially when there are multiple molecules that you want to resolve within this resolution. So all of these six molecules are emitting light, and they are spread all by this much. And when you image, you, this will be a fuzzy image like this, you can't see, you can't tell whether there are six of them or there are eight of them unless you know I tell you how many there are. So the resolution is a big issue with light microscopy. 
So thinking about the cells, E. coli cells, uh, they are about one micrometer in size. So the resolution, the circle uh, that the light uh, is spread is almost half of the cell. And if I put the perspective of this circle in this uh, diagram, that, is, that covers multiple recipes. So uh, when we use conventional light microscopy, we cannot resolve what's happening within this circle. So there, nowadays, there are better techniques called super resolution microscopy that, can allow, that allows us to resolve what's happening within this circle. So for in the future, hopefully, I can tell you what's our progress on that uh, end uh, using better microscopy techniques to resolve this traffic phenomena inside the cell. So with that, I'd like to conclude. So today, I told you about uh, the DNA is important, cell, important to the cell, just like recipe book is critical for making a bakery, to open a bakery. And uh, DNA needs to be copied to produce proteins or the bread. And these copy machines, or called RNA polymerases, create traffic problem in the genome. And uh, there was interesting density and space density and speed relationship for these RNA polymerases, and we think that this relationship can be explained by the DNA supercooling. The fact that the road is not a flat road, but it's actually a flexible polymer that can be twisted. So physics helps us to develop mathematical models to explain this phenomenon, and then also uh, help us to design and develop cool instruments to create and visualize DNA supercalls. Okay, with that, I'd like to end and then uh, happy to answer any questions. Um, thank you for being our Julia Child. <laughs> Um, it, was, it was a great walk through recipes. Question, who controls the um, copy machines as to when and where to go? Yeah, that's a very good question. So there are multiple ways that is, con that, that is uh, controlled. And one example is that um, the star side of the recipe can be blocked by a protein. And then the protein basically receive the signal and then leave the DNA, leave the start site, and opening up the start site for the copy machine to come in to start copying. So there can be additional molecule that is uh, blocking or bound to the start site, and then controlling when and when uh, when the copying should start. I also thank you so much for this presentation. It's fun. Um, near the end, you mentioned that you need a good microscope well beyond light to uh, see what you want to see with a living cell. What is like one of the most likely technologies? Does it use x-rays or uh, what, what are some likely things yeah, for yeah. a good microscope? Yeah, so if we use a microscope that is based on electron beams, they have smaller, uh, much smaller wavelengths, so they can resolve much better. So that, was, that technique was used in the 1970s picture. So it had very, ni very nice resolution to actually show us the DNA and RNA polymerases that are running on the DNA. But to use electron microscope, cells should be fixed and they should be basically be dead. Um, so you cannot see what's happening in real time inside the living cells. So to see what's happening in living cells, probably light microscopy is the only way. The microscopy that is using lasers or any visible lights, like white light. And then to, ha to achieve high resolution, nowadays there is better uh, dyes, better fluorophores, or better 
dyes that we can attach to molecule that we want to visualize, then we can basically uh, achieve higher resolution by using different chemistry or chemical to label things. Oh, uh, 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 hi, Professor. Thank you for like the interesting and inspiring lecture. Uh, my question is, I'm like, uh, like, how do you draw a mathematical formula by simply <clears throat> measuring out the points of density in like the polymerasing process? And how do you preserve the physical meaning of your formula by simply measuring like the like just one variable as density? Thank you. So we want to keep our physical meaning as much as possible, but at the same time, we want to simplify the model, right? We don't want to make the model too complicated. So there is always compromise between the two. Um, so this is the, currently the model is basically the result of the compromise. Thank you so much. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Thank you, that was so interesting. I was wondering if you have any um, applicability that you're thinking you're gonna have for any specific disease states or the aging process or anything like that that might come from the results of your experiments. Yeah, so that's also a very interesting future direction. So um, whether it's related to health or aging of the cells and so on, I think there's definitely interesting um, possibility that um, the, uh, we can see different speed and density relationship between the healthiness of a cell. Uh, because depending on the healthiness of cell, uh, there can be different factors. Like the, in the normal state, basically there are certain factors that are helping the RNA polymerase to work, but maybe they are gone in the disease state. So it's definitely an interesting topic for the future, how the disease state or healthiness of a cell affects this these phenomenon, right? Uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, helping us understand the, the rate of, uh, as the as the, the clogging rate, I would say, call, it, call it. But um, what I didn't understand uh, was if you can't see these with the uh, light microscopy, how did you physically measure the rates of these uh, little copy machines, if you will, for the initial experiments that you right. showed us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we cannot look at, because there are so many copy machines inside the cell, if we look at all of them, yeah. they will basically look like this, or even bigger blob, because there are so many of the copy machines uh, working together. So our trick was to, instead of looking for the copy machine, we were looking for the recipe that, that is made out of this specific gene or DNA. So the, the code for the recipe is unique. It's basically unique for this part of the recipe. So if we look at, um, let's say, you need to decorate your cake with Santa, right? So any part of the genome or recipe book would not have this, uh, this text, right? So if we look for where we can find Santa, mention of Santa, there's only one place where it can be found. So it's basically a situation like this case. So instead of RNA, uh, copying machines are everywhere inside the cell, the mention about Santa is happening only here. So we were basically looking for this one spot that is basically changing over time. Now, I mean, how did, did you label it with some yes. type of chemistry? Yes. And then look for that, that yes. dye or whatever it is? Exactly. Oh, okay. So you were using, so, on that, did you tag the copy machine itself? So to, uh, what we did was, so this uh, copy of the recipe transcript is single-stranded uh, right. RNA, which is, can be complementary to another piece of uh, uh, RNA or DNA, because of a, comp that the two, uh, a single-stranded nucleic acid can complement each other. 
-hmm. So we basically introduced a code or a piece of uh, labeled uh, single-stranded probe that is complementary to the code that we are looking for. Oh. So they basically recognized the code and then visualized where the code is. And that was that that little piece that you put on there was actually tagged or yes. with a chem, with yes. some type of flor yes. fluorometry yes. or something. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Hi. Th thanks for breaking the ice for the new and improved yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Saturday morning physics. Um, it seems like um, it's more efficient for these uh, copy machines to travel in pairs. Um, yes, yeah. close, close together. Is, do you think the cell might have any mechanism to introduce two at a time so that you get the best um, efficiency? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, you need, uh, if there is only two going on, then it can be also a problem. It basically, our model tells us, tells us that it, there should be continuous introduction of copy machines to the recipe. If it suddenly stops, then even though there are four copy machines running together, they immediately slow down because the last one is starting to uh, accumulate the super coal and not being rescued. Um, so actually, so that basically means that inside the cell to make optimal copying process to happen, Basically, the, the entrance should be continuously open, and then they should basically introduce the copy machines continuously. Yeah, make a lot. Thank you. Um, things like uh, having cancer or growing old, are they related with all this um, dynamic of um, Motion? Yeah, certainly. So because this copying, machine, copying process is so essential, so that's basically the start of how proteins are made. And many of these diseases are from malfunctioning of proteins or the fact that proteins are not made properly or the bread is not made properly. So often this copying process has made errors and that results in making wrong bread. So often the disease are basically starting from the fact that this copying process had errors or it didn't happen properly. So this is like the fundamental process that many of these disease-related scientists are basically working on to see why there is an error in this copying process and how you can basically diagnose that error and how you can kind of fix this error to happen. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, like you mentioned near the end that the next goal would be to try to get like a higher, like a better, like imaging with like better quality. Like, and you also said about like the super resolution fluorescence um, technique. Like, like, I guess like what's the progress on like going toward that step? Because mm -hmm. like, are there any like, is, is there a problem with like um, not finding the dyes that can bind to the things yeah. that we want to image? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So currently we have better microscope that can resolve better, but uh, we need better dyes too to, uh, that works better too. So uh, both physics microscopy field and also the labeling and the chemistry field should grow together to make this happen. Do we have any other questions? We have one question over here. Yeah. Um, very interesting presentation. And Thank uh, you. I just wanted to ask, is it possible for the copying machine to detach somehow? Yes, so that can also happen. So ideal case, it should uh, detach only at the end of the recipe. But sometimes it detaches in the middle. Sometimes that detachment is good for the cell, uh, but sometimes it's bad for the cell because it doesn't finish the, uh, copying the recipe. 
So that detachment is also an interesting phenomenon for many biologists are basically studying when does it happen and how does it happen. Any other questions? Yes. How is speed related to copying errors? Copying errors. Is speed related to copying errors? That's an excellent because question that I wanted to study. So, <laughs> yeah, so I, I think that, so there are many, uh, um, many uh, machines inside the cell that's, that is moving on the DNA like this copy machine. And for those, uh, those, um, those machines, people have already shown that the speed and the, error, the way they copy or read the, read the code is related. But not much is known for this particular copy machine. So that's definitely uh, that we want to address in the future. Any other questions? If it, yeah. if the protein causes the, if the very protein that's used to read the DNA causes problems, then why get, do they even use it? Then why do the cells use it? Why not find something better that doesn't it with the DNA? So if the, there are proteins on the DNA that is hurting the copy machine, right? Um, so sometimes, so um, so I, I so so one example is there are roadblocks on the DNA that uh, that I so whenever I drew DNA and copy machines, there were only DNA and copy machine. There were no other roadblocks on the DNA, but in reality, there are lots of roadblocks on the DNA that is blocking the copy machines. And they are there, the roadblocks are there to regulate the other processes. And also the roadblocks are there to fold the DNA to, into this small space uh, uh, within the cell. So there are other proteins are there to, for other functions, but happen to prevent the copy machines. So uh, copy machines basically have to deal with those. Um, yeah, so it's not easy task although it's an essential process for the cells to uh, live. Twisting? So, so it doesn't need a supercoil, but it happened to be supercoil because the way DNA is made. So because DNA is made of like rope, to form it? Better, better than the copy machine? Yeah, that's a very interesting idea. Um, so, Yeah, so um, so there are definitely better copy machines in terms of speed. So some copy machines run super fast, uh, but when they run super fast, they also produce this uh, twisting much faster. So um, it always follows with the motion of these copy machines because the fact that these copy machines have to open the two strands of the rope to read uh, what's between them. So the side effect of is that the DNA is being twisted and this should be rescued somehow. Yeah. Thank you for your questions. What, I'll the mic. What reconnects the DNA once the RNA has gone by? You talk about it splitting apart. What puts it back together? 
So yeah, so DNAs have um, the two strands are basically, um, how should I say, bound to each other or they stay like to stay bound because the, in between the strands there are bases that are uh, basically recognizing each other. Mm -hmm. So uh, RNA polymerase can try to open this or uh, remove this interaction, but when RNA polymerase is gone, they basically go back to stick together. The chemical reaction. Yes, yes, the chemical bond between them. There are any more? Okay. Well, thank you everyone for coming to our first Saturday Physics for Everyone this fall. Um, we have four more on the schedule. The next one will be on October 8th, um, the same time and place. And um, Professor Charles Gamme will be talking about taking a picture of the black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy. Um, and so, Let's thank uh, Professor Sunjin Kim for her time. Thank you. And